Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. It's Amin here with the Mind House podcast episode 62. Now, this episode, unfortunately, uh, Muhammad's not with me for very, very good reasons, which I'm sure you'll find out eventually. But uh, alhamdulillah, um, we're going to continue, inshallah. We need to keep up the consistency, uh, inshallah. And um, perhaps in the next few episodes, we'll have a few other people on as well uh, until Muhammad comes back. So uh, that that should be good. It should be at least a different flavor. I don't, I'm not saying anyone's better than Muhammad, but or anyone's as good as Muhammad, but we'll see what we can do. Some uh, diversity will be good, I'm sure, will be refreshing. So... Uh, in this episode, what I'm going to do, just going to get to some of the questions that's, that have been kind of hanging around the curious cat for a while, for a few weeks. So I'll, I'll reply to some of them. Uh, one of them is directed at me directly. The other two are kind of, um, they're kind of, uh, you know, general. And so I'll just get to them, inshallah, I get to them all. Some interesting stuff. So yeah, I hope you, I hope you enjoy, inshallah. So, um, the first question was, Wait, let me just think, is there anything I have to say before we start these? I feel like I'm, I'm going a bit too fast here. Um, um, no, no, okay, let's go. <laughs> so the first question is, Salam, it would be great to have an episode about artificial intelligence and what you both think about it. So hmm, I just realized now that the question is asking for an episode on it. So I wasn't intending to do an episode on it. I was just going to answer the questions, uh, the question about about this. Um, maybe we can expand on it, I'm sure, because I won't give like a full detailed answer here. But um, yeah, so I just uh, tried to prepare a little bit for this uh, more than usual. Because, you know, usually with Mind Heist, we pretty much don't prepare. Uh, sometimes I prepare, I'll prepare a topic. I might do some bullet points, some prompts. Um, and then it's just conversation from there, like natural conversation. However, when I'm on my own, um, I guess I don't have that time when Muhammad's thinking for me to then gather my thoughts. And so I thought I would put down some thoughts. And, you know, for this one on AI, I, I was thinking, you know, I know a bit about AI. Like, I'm kind of in that world a little bit. Like, I'm interested in uh, technology. I'm interested in the future of uh, how the world is going to be and stuff like that. And AI, you know, you can't ignore it when it comes to that. Um, but then I thought, you know, but do I even have an opinion on it? So I had to sit down, I had to think about it, I had to write a few notes. And uh, yeah, so the, the question is, you know, what are your thoughts on AI? So firstly, I think AI is like so many different things. Um, and we are only seeing a few forms of it right now. But uh, there, are, there are different forms of it. Like there's AI, which is like... Um, what we see on Facebook and Instagram, for example, the way they use um, AI to to curate the content on your on your news feed, right? But then there's other types of AI, which is like I think they call it singularity, which is um, like having an AI that can create or improve itself. Yeah, uh, I think they call that singularity. That's kind of like the Terminator stuff where. Um, the AI can start to actually think a little bit independently of uh, humans and it can actually learn new things, new skills and it can eventually do anything it wants kind of thing. So there are so many things which comes under the big umbrella term of, of artificial intelligence. Um, you know, machine learning is one of them, etc. I'm not an expert, but, you know, I, I know there's, it's a kind of big umbrella term. Um, and like most things, I think AI is like good and bad, like there's some good, there's some bad in it. But like many like modern inventions and improvements that we've seen, it has like definitely a, a comfort, help, uh, like improvement comfort wise, um, ease wise, maybe helps you save time. Um, it definitely helps businesses save money and stuff like that. But society wise intellectually culturally all these things um even morally i think the overall negative might end up being much more than the positive you know um trying to think of an example like okay so for example no that's not a good example uh let's move on inshallah i might come up with an example i've got some examples but not for that particular thing so um for example, yeah, 
Facebook uses a type of AI to show you content that you're most likely to engage with. And uh, that makes Facebook more engaging for you. Okay, so when you're, you know, you let's talk about Instagram because I don't think anyone uses Facebook anymore, even though that's the only kind of social media that I use. But uh, hey, so on Instagram, you're you follow like a thousand different people, different accounts, and that's too much content to fit in your feed, right? Let's say you only look at 50 posts a day, but there are a thousand new posts a day. So um, Instagram has to decide, like, what do we show this person now? Instagram has used like an algorithm to determine what would be shown and in what order. Okay. Um, and the thing is like, this is not that kind of singularity type of AI where it can make its own decisions. Um, AI, most AI it's used these days, like you have to give it the objective and then it will just, uh, do so many variables and tests, do so many experiments all simultaneously kind of thing to determine the quickest and most efficient way of getting to that objective. So what Instagram has done is they have told their algorithm that the goal is engagement. Whatever generates the most engagement, show that to people in their feed. Okay. So that's, that's all that the AI will optimize for is engagement. It won't take into account, uh, stuff like, uh, how positive the content will make you feel, how negative it will make you feel, how empowered it will make you feel, how weak and pathetic it will make you feel. It doesn't take any of these things into account. It doesn't take into account even, uh, maybe, uh, advertising uh, money generated for the platform. Um, it's number one metric that it is optimizing for and that it, it has been instructed to to make the highest possible is engagement. Okay. And what does that what does that mean? You know, in, in real life, when you're scrolling through Instagram, it means that it's going to show you um, a lot of the shocking, a lot of the overhyped, a lot of the dr dramatic uh, kind of posts, um, and anything else that will get a lot of likes, a lot of engagement, um, stuff like, uh, uh, unfortunately, you know, like these kind of, uh, revealing posts maybe of certain, uh, whatever they called Instagram models or something like that. It might show you, uh, although most of this stuff is blocked, but something to do with violence, maybe something to do with a shocking violent story that happened. Um, stuff like this, a lot of gossip stuff, just because people tend to interact with that. So because the AI has been told that the goal is engagement, it shows you stuff that gets engagement, regardless of if that's good for you or not. Now, the po positive side of this is that it makes your newsfeed uh, interesting, right? Um, it also obviously it's custom based on you. So it's not going to show you stuff that you absolutely never engage with, even if other people engage with it. Um, it's a balance of what is generally engaging to people and then what is engaging specifically to you. And it puts that together kind of thing, right? So the positive part of this is that out of those thousand posts, uh, it tends to find the 50 most interesting posts to you, which makes your experience on Instagram uh, better, right? Um, uh, but then is that even a good thing, right? So your time on Instagram is more enjoyable, more engaging in theory, and you, therefore you spend more time on it. But is spending time on it even good? I mean, I would argue it's not good, right? Because it's, you're not, when you get off Instagram, if you ever do get off it, like when is the actual time you get off it? It's not really a clear boundary there. But when you, you know, lock your phone or whatever, um, what have you got out of that? You know, what have you gained? Um, that's a big question to ask. And so spending more time on Instagram, I don't think that's something good for the user, something good for Instagram, because the longer you spend on it, the more ads they can show you, etc., And the more likely you're going to come back. Um, so the negative side is wasting time. Now, the other negative side, which, you know, a lot of people have talked about is stuff like, um, echo chambers, you know, so you're only shown stuff that you're likely to engage with. And therefore, they're never going to show you stuff that you don't agree with, you know, and, um, you know, this was, you know, talked a lot about in terms of politics. So let's say in the US, if you're um, left leaning, if you would vote, you know, you're uh, a staunch, um, what do they call it? Democrat, if you're a staunch de Democrat, liberal, then if you go on Instagram, you're not going to see any right wing posts, which means you're going to have your own ideas reinforced again and again and again and again. If we take that to the Muslim context, it means you're going to, you know, let's say you, I don't know, um, 
let's say you 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 get into this niche of muslims that, that all they talk about is the end of times and the signs of the end of times and a lot of potential theories of what could be happening yet juj majuj dajjal this and that yeah if you're in that in that kind of niche and that's the stuff you engage with then and you join groups based on that and you follow pages based on that and you add friends based on that and out of your friends you tend to engage with the ones who post about that stuff more than the others then guess what your facebook your instagram feed is gonna uh, look like it's going to be a lot of stuff about that and so your opinion on that is only going to get stronger and stronger and stronger uh, there's no content on your feed that is questioning um you know it's questioning if you should be uh perhaps questioning your own opinion there's no content that's uh, proving your points wrong and so it ends up with people ha having very strong opinions sometimes with no good reason like okay you've been shown one side of the story but you don't even know the other side so how do you know your side of the story is strong you know what i mean and so that's just one example of how it plays out in the muslim context and you know subhanallah actually on a side point like i joined a certain facebook group last week it was a facebook created by somebody whose posts i find you know quite insightful quite interesting and yet the type of people that were gathering this group were just completely the type of people that I ran away from when I left Twitter and all of that years ago. And yet I find them in this group, you know, very negative people uh, attacking everything. Nothing is good enough for them. Um, you know, any uh, you know, public figure, they're calling them out. They, they're it's very negative. I don't, uh, you know, it's not what I kind of signed up for at all. Right. And the thing is, in the comments, it's like everyone's reinforcing each other's ideas, even though the ideas yeah, and they are very wrong. Like they're very one-sided. They're very extreme. They're very and he coming from people who are obviously not educated uh, in Islam or even in how the real world works. And so, imagine somebody who's stuck in that echo chamber. What that's going to do for them? So that is like the result of an algorithm of of AI is sticking you in your echo chamber and having your opinions reinforced rather than being questioned. And why is it that it ends up like that where you're in an echo chamber? It's because the the uh, Instagram has told the algorithm the objective, and the objective is clear. It is engagement. It is not diversity of opinion. It is not uh, making uh, Instagram intellectually stimulating. That's not the goal. The goal is um, engagement. Okay, and you know, fair play to them. I'm not like one of them, like business hating people. I'm just saying that this is the result of an AI. When you tell it that this is the objective, it will. It is really good at going out there and achieving that result. Um, and how does it do that? It's from the tons and tons of data that they get from the platform. You know, when you have, is it uh, over a billion um, monthly active users now on Instagram? When you have a billion monthly active users, you know, people logging on every single day. Well, they don't even have to log. I don't know why we use the word log on because there is no log on anymore. It's just open the app and you're logged in, right? So when people open the app every day, they're giving Instagram data on what is engaging and what isn't. And the algorithm is just getting uh, more and more honed, right? And, you know, on a side point, when I advertise, you know, as I do for my, uh, in my business, when I advertise on Instagram, on Facebook, I benefit from this, you know, because, um, they have a lot of data on what people are likely to be interested in and the type of actions they are likely to take. You know, when you make a purchase, let's say you, uh, you're on Facebook, you're on Instagram, or even you're logged into it in the background. Um, if you make a purchase, online it's very likely that instagram and facebook will know about that purchase uh, because the website you made the purchase on will have a tracking code there installed a facebook tracking code uh, which will send data back into facebook to let facebook know that okay this is somebody that does buy um online and uh, what do you think that help that how that helps us advertisers it means those are people that buy online um, they are a very good people to target with your ads, right? Because if you your your past your past behavior uh, is likely to pre is a good predictor of your future behavior. So somebody who's bought five times in the last month will be much more likely to buy again than somebody who's bought one time in the last month. You know, so all of this data really helps out. Now that I haven't even mentioned the other side effect of this, which is like I kind of briefly touched on is the emotional and mental well-being of people um, on Instagram. So 
because the algorithm, the AI is being told to like uh, optimize for engagement, um, you know, a lot of engagement comes from negative things, you know, oh, so and so uh, went on a killing spree, you know, what uh, does that post do? It, it usually gets a lot of comments, either people very angry, it's basically emotionally charged. Yeah. So anything extreme will get more engagement than something which is vanilla, something that is not extreme. You know, imagine somebody uh, posting some beautiful poetry. Yeah, I don't even really like poetry, but let's say there's beautiful poetry. That is not extreme. That is not shocking. That doesn't, unless you sit down and really take it in and think about it, which is not the type of place Instagram is anyway, it will not elicit any emotion from you. But yet, you know, a New Zealand shooter kills 50 Muslims in a mosque, straight away your emotions getting triggered. So what do you do? You like it, um, you comment, you share it. You know, this is engagement. And so what does that do for your newsfeed? It makes your newsfeed full of um, extreme things, emotionally charged things. And what it, what does that do to your psyche? What does that do to your mentality? Um, probably makes you feel like, um, the world's a negative place. Um, there's no hope. There's nothing we can do. You know, Allah alam, but these kind of thoughts, which, you know, personally, I don't want going through my head. What I want to influence my worldview personally is like the Quran, basically. Like, I just want to read the Quran. And if the Quran tells me, for example, Al-Aqibatu lil taqwa or Al-Aqibatu lil muttaqeen, if Allah is telling me that the final um result the final good things is for the people of taqwa or is for the, the yeah the people of taqwa then i want that to be my world view and so when i go throughout my day i just try and do things of taqwa because that's the people that get the final good end um whereas if i'm uh, going through my instagram and i'm just seeing people of taqwa being um written about in certain newspapers negatively people making fun of them people killing them people putting them in prison if i keep reading that i'm not going to feel like al aqibatu lil muttaqin am i so i uh yeah i just want my kind of uh i want my world view to be influenced by the quran by the sunnah primarily that's the first place and then other things like reading when you read a book it's uh obviously a, there has to be a good book a decent book but the amount of effort that has to go into writing a book and then especially if the book gets recommended to you by someone you trust or it's generally rated to be a good book that is a very different level of filtering to just following someone on instagram right so you know you got a question uh when it comes to AI, like what? Okay, so if I've said engagement is is a bad thing to optimize for for Instagram, in terms of the the end results of that, what would be a good thing? And that's the difficulty is that, like what what is measurable? Like what data does Instagram have that's like measurable that it should optimize for? Let's say if its main objective was to um, make people feel better or make people intellectually stimulated or make people, let's say, make people more pious, make people have more taqwa. What would it tell the algorithm to optimize for? It's very difficult. You know, it's very difficult when you get to these more nuanced feelings and emotions and non-binary things, you know, like with engagement, it's binary. It's did they engage with the post or did they not, you know, but when it's like, okay, how did this post combined with the other 50 posts they saw today contribute to them being a better person or a worse person that is extremely hard to measure and so in one uh, to to some extent i can't blame blame um instagram obviously i would also always blame uh, the people that use instagram more because instagram is doing what they do they have tens of thousands of employees they can afford those employees because People like you and I use the product, use the, the app. But if we didn't, then it would be a different story, wouldn't it? So I always blame the people more than the businesses because the businesses are just following what people want most of the time. So that's kind of one example of AI uh, not being too constructive, not being able to you know, any use nuance. And um, yeah, it's a very binary end result that it's optimizing for, which is engagement yes or no yeah this gets more engagement okay do it more show it more 
Yeah. So that's one example. The other example, interestingly, is Cambridge Analytica, which um, no, not forget Cambridge Analytica for now. Um, in the 2016 U.S. Uh, presidential elections, um, Trump hired a company to do his advertising on Facebook for him. Yeah. Now, this person that he hired was turned out to be quite a genius. OK. And what this person did is they focused on the states that, you know, they call them swing states, yeah, like a state which is historically doesn't always vote one way nor the other. Yeah, they're, they're kind of, they're primed for influence. Yeah, these are the people that if we influence them, we're going to win the election. Yeah, so they focused on those states. And then they also focused on an ethnic level or a community level like where you live or the type of neighborhood you live or the type of race um at least in in facebook thinks you are yeah so if it has data on you suggesting that you're black for example then uh you used to be able to target people based on that uh on facebook yeah they removed it now because of the um controversy so what this uh, guy did right um they spent you know millions of dollars on ads and they would for example show black people for example um ads um uh, showing Hillary to be anti-black, for example, or they would show Christian people um, stuff that makes Hillary look like she's anti-religion, or makes Trump look like he's um, uh, pro pro Christianity or whatever, right? Um, and this micro level of targeting, like targeting people based on uh, their religion or their ethnicity and stuff like that. It gives you a very, it's like a very scary way of manipulating emotions. And I believe, you know, a lot of people have said this. I believe that had a very significant impact in the results of the, of the elections. Um, this ability to kind of target people on that level and deliver a message that is custom to them. And these posts, um, these ads were very, you know, emotionally charged. Okay, and when you see ads like that again and again, remember these ads were done over months, yeah, maybe a year. So imagine 12 months, you're seeing here and there these ads. And you might just read the ad and scroll on, but sub subliminally, subconsciously, sorry, it will influence you. So then when you go to vote and you don't really, you're not really sold on either candidate, you just pick whatever. And it turns out that they picked Trump. Perhaps, you know, a reason is, is because of these um, ads. So um, how does this fit into AI, right? These are just people running ads. Well, the thing is, AI can't work without um, big data. Yeah, you need big data. You need data, you know, uh, millions of data points to do something like this. So when you get big data and you add AI on top of that, you get this immense power where you can uh, manipulate people's emotions on a very customized basis. Like advertising, it already does that on a mass scale there. Yeah? So, for example, like L'Oreal or whatever these companies, they try to manipulate emotions of like all women. Yeah, they'll do like a TV campaign that, that everyone will see. And they try and manipulate emotions. But what if you could do that on a micro level where it's like, okay, anyone who's black in London, we show them this message. And then anyone who's, you know, you know, South Asian living in London, show them this message because that's a more customized, tailored message for that person. And it will evoke more emotion if we use this picture versus that picture. And there's a whole lot of testing that can go on when it go on when it comes to like advertising on Facebook. I mean, believe me, I've done it myself. So, um, yeah, so that's that's quite dark, isn't it? Because uh, imagine you imagine your Facebook. Yeah, you're not even an advertiser. Let's say your Facebook and you want okay this is a, this is a bit deep so you want egyptians to start to dislike um or distrust hadith what do you do you just add a little tweak into the algorithm where you say um if a post okay so there's a something called uh, actually i don't know what's called but there's a type of analysis of text where uh it can determine using this is ai again it can determine is the general tone of this uh, paragraph positive or negative okay so let's say i'm facebook and i have a bad agenda i want um uh, muslims in egypt to distrust hadith okay so what do i do i go to my algorithm and i tweak it and i say 
if a post, so I add this rule kind of thing to the algorithm, if this post includes the word hadith or it's quoting a hadith, okay, and the tone is negative, then give it a little boost, like let it be seen by a little more people. And if it's the tone of the text is positive, then show it to a few less people, okay? Now, you might think that's insignificant, like, okay, a little boost and a little this and a little that. But remember, Facebook is used, you know, millions of times. Like in Egypt, okay, there's 90 million people. Uh, let's say, I don't know, 50 million of them, 60 million of them have Facebook. They use Facebook, let's say, on average once a week. This kind of exposure is going to have an effect at least on a subconscious level. Maybe only, maybe 10% of them, it would have a conscious uh, effect but a subconscious effect it would affect much more yeah so this is the level like if you were facebook you have all the data and you have uh the visibility and you can reach uh, billions of people this is the type of social and mental and psychological engineering you can do i watched a video last week very interesting it was about you know brexit yeah like british exit from the eu okay and the guy was saying that from the day that the media started calling it Brexit, the referendum was already done. It was already decided that they would leave the EU. Why? He said because the word Brexit includes the word exit. And so subconsciously, the assumption, if you like, the leaning, if you like, is towards exit. So when the guy who's confused... Yeah, he said, let's say 10% of people were very much pro-Brexit and 10% were very much against. The other 80% were unaware, kind of ignorant of the matter. What's better for the country? I don't really know. But when you hear Brexit, 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 Brexit in the media every day, you read it on social media, etc. Every day you talk about it, you say Brexit. When you go to vote and you're not sure and you just remember subconsciously the word exit, 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 you're like, um, yeah, I'll vote for Brexit. Yeah, Brexit. And so you vote to exit. Yeah, he said, he said, Diani, that would have a uh, some level of material significant impact on the results. It might be the magnitude of 3%. But how much was the referendum won by? It was won by, I believe, something like 1.8%. So sometimes all you need to do is nudge people's feelings to a degree of 1.8% to have like a material impact on uh, well, the, the future of a whole country in this case, very, very significant, uh, impact. So, okay, that, that part was not about AI, okay, but it's about, uh, subconscious programming. And I was gonna say that, yes, uh, someone like Facebook or advertiser like Donald Trump's team, they can influence your, um, behavior, your emotions, um, in the ways I described. Um, and the example was Brexit. Another example is that apparently it's proven that if a doctor has a pen or a mug with a certain drug company's logo on it, he is proven, according to his research, he's proven to prescribe that drug over another similar drug. It's completely subconscious. If you ask him, he'll say, yeah, all these drugs are equal. But what does he prescribe? He prescribes the one that's on his mug with the logo on his mug. It's all subconscious. So, it's just crazy. It's just crazy. And that's why, you know, on the flip side, you got to really believe in the power of dhikr, you know, and the power of reading Quran and the power of prayer and the power of um, certain images, you know, that you see. So just how this has a negative effect, you know, the flip side, reading Quran every day, exposing yourself to Quran every day, listening to Quran, having Quran playing in your house, your children growing up hearing Quran it must surely, it would have a significant impact, right? So that's AI, okay? Now, I've said a lot of negative things. Um, I'm actually going to continue down that path here. So, <laughs> um, so yeah, personally, like, because of what I've mentioned, I'm concerned about a few companies like Google, which has a ton of data, but they haven't, there hasn't been too much controversy about them yet, yeah? Google has a ton of data. Facebook has a ton of data. Obviously, Facebook owns Instagram. They own WhatsApp. So you, do you not think they can do um, mm -hmm. analysis mm -hmm. uh, analysis of your WhatsApp messages? 
Now they say that they they're encrypted, but uh, who knows if that's true or not? But um, maybe there is a way they can do analysis of your WhatsApp texts to get. They, they won't be able to read it themselves like real people, but they would get a feel for what kind of mood are you in? What kind of person are you? And they could kind of categorize you, okay? So this level of power, you know, is very dangerous in the hands of people without Islamic a way of thinking, without the philosophy of Islam, without um, maybe moral guidance, um, without, yeah, without, like, it's just too much power. It's too much power. Especially considering that the power goes beyond one country. Like, everyone in the world has Facebook and Instagram and WhatsApp, you know, except for China. Like, everyone's got it. And then China has their own thing, you know, WeChat and all of this, where they can do their own um, subliminal programming of people's uh, thoughts and emotions and stuff. So, too much power, very dangerous. Um, I would not be surprised whatsoever if this is the type of thing that the Dajjal can use to manipulate people's think uh, thoughts people's emotions make them follow him make them question Allah and stuff like this yani it's not a big leap to to guess something like that okay uh, and the final thing is uh, you know a way that i believe it could be used is something like predictive policing where you can actually it's like in that film um minority report where they have these weird people that can see the future or something like that but i don't believe that it's not forget that rubbish yeah but the idea is is p perhaps could happen where they've got so much data on the types of people that do certain crimes that they could predict a crime now they don't know the ghaib so they won't be able to predict it 100 percent accurately but imagine they'll be like okay um 90 percent of people that commit burglaries have xyz characteristics you just entered into that category now, okay, based on our data. And so we're worried you're going to commit a crime. So for that reason, we're going to track you uh, for the next, you know, three months. And if you don't, if, if you get out of that category, you change your traits or whatever, then we'll leave you alone. You know, this is the type of thing that could happen. Why wouldn't that happen? You know, especially when people are scared, like when crime goes up, unfortunately, people will are willing to give up a lot of their rights and their privacy uh, in order to feel safe. You know, so I, uh, you can imagine, Yanni, uh, so on a side point, you know, with this like coronavirus, you know, what could happen? Like people are so scared of this virus, they're so scared of it spreading. And then the government says, look, like we're taking care of this, but we need you to comply. So we're going to establish a quarantine. We're going to establish a, um, what's it called? A curfew. You know, you're not allowed to leave your house like this. We're going to say, look, uh, we're going to ban certain products because it's dangerous for the spread of the virus. How much control and, uh, Yanni, how much, how many changes are, would you be willing to accept under the guise of, this is to save you from a virus. Very scary, right? Very scary. So with all this in mind, yeah, whoops, with all this in mind that these are the, the downsides, what is the benefits? You know, the benefits is something like, um, oh, Amazon knows that you're going to run out of toilet paper soon, so order it for you. You don't have to think about it. You know, um, other benefits is like, okay, someone like me can target the right people on Facebook and therefore, you get to see ads that are personalized for you. You could discover some good products. Um, the ads are not like annoying. They're actually quite engaging. Um, you know, that, that's another benefit. It's a small benefit though. Um, what are the other benefits of this? I mean, I'm sure there are a ton of benefits. I'm not, I'm not denying that. It's just that the benefits are often like very material. And I think material benefits are not worth it when you look at the downsides which are psychological which are moral which are ethical so if i'm gonna you know to extreme example i'm gonna start disbelieving in the hadith let's say uh, i'm gonna start disbelieving in hadith um and but but okay because of this ai manipulation etc but on the flip side i get a fridge that can order eggs for me automatically you know, it's like it doesn't weigh, it doesn't balance out to be good. So I think a lot of these technological benefits we get, you know, like no doubt back in the day, it was very difficult to live. Uh, people died earlier. 
um, etc. You know, people had to walk to find food. They had to work very hard to find food. They had to travel months to trade. Um, you know, uh, it's very difficult. Yeah, people having horrible illnesses. People, you know, getting X Y Z illness. You have to like cut your foot off to save yourself, and very difficult. Okay. However, as Muslims, we always know that. يعني والآخرة خير وأبقى. You know, the آخرة it's better. If you're Muslim, of course, it's better and it lasts a, long, a longer lasting. So, you know, we don't want to sacrifice the akhirah for the dunya. And I think sometimes that trade happens, you know, when we go down this route of ease and comfort. Like we we start using these technologies to make our lives easier and more comfortable. But what we trade for it sometimes is too much. We're trading too much. And it's not like a, it's not a choice that we actively make. Like nobody was demanding Facebook to come about. Nobody was demanding for AI, you know, and algorithms to be created and designed. Nobody was asking for like data to be collected on them. Yeah, no one was asking for it. But since it came and we saw the benefits, we bought into it. And of course, the benefit of some of these things is life becomes more comfortable. You know, jobs like some boring jobs gets removed and people start doing more engaging jobs. Um you know, we have more free time, we have more free energy to do stuff like dawa and reading and learning. Obviously, who knows how many people actually use that extra time for that. But in theory, it's good. But when you think of the downsides, it's just scary. And I think materially and comfort wise, what we need to be comfortable is actually quite low, you know. And I think there's a hadith of the Prophet ﷺ saying, you know, whoever has like a nice uh, riding beast or something, a good wife, and a house, then it's like he's got the whole dunya. Something like that, right? And that's what I think. I think if you've got food, shelter, uh, clothes, family, you know, some good, you know, good company, um, you know, you, you you at least know like, okay, I, I can eat this week. You know, I'm not going to die from starvation. Yeah. Um, these kind of things, once you've got that, like, as long as you've got that and you're Dean, like you're kind of okay. Like I think we underestimate how much humans can adapt. You know, like humans adapt to hardship um, eventually. You know, it might take a while, might take one generation, but people adapt. Whereas like this kind of negative effects of, of comfort and, and these technologies that bring us comfort and free time and stuff. Yeah, and he, some of that damage might be forever. You know what I mean? So just got to be careful with this stuff. Um, I love technology. I mean, I'm into it. I'm always like watching videos about it and I'm very interested in it. But you just can't deny some of these negative effects, you know. Uh, now, how long have I been going? Have I been going for a whole hour just on AI? Allahumma sallim, yani, what the hell? Let me check the time. Okay, I've been going like 38 minutes. No problem. So, uh, let's move on to the next question, which was... Well, you know, knowing that I've been going for 38 minutes, I'm actually going to skip to just do one more question, which was, Assalamu alaikum, brothers. You haven't posted for a while now after being consistent for quite a while. I hope everything's all right with you both. Okay, this must have been around a month ago, I think. My question is directed to Amin. He has mentioned in a couple or maybe a few ep podcast episodes that it was exactly what I expected regarding getting married and having a child. What does he mean by that? And how can we get expected results? What's the magic formula of expecting and then getting a result as expected? Also, how would he have reacted if it didn't go as expected? Because it seems to me that the phrase, it's as expected, has no sense of gratitude in it. Jazakumullah khairan, bros, keep up the good work. Okay, so this is a good one for me to answer because it's directed at me. Um, <clears throat> interestingly, you know, I was reading it and the final thing that I guess it's a he, um, says is, uh, it seems to me that the phrase, it's as expected, has no sense of gratitude in it. I had to think like quite a few times about that. Like, what does, what does he mean? Um, but I think I got it now. I think I understand. It's like, it's like, I, it's like dismissing the good side of it. So, oh, I got married. Oh, I had a baby. And it was a, it was as expected. Like, Okay, but come on, like, be grateful the fact that you got married, the fact that you had a baby, the baby's healthy, this, this, like, be grateful instead of saying, yeah, I expected it to be good, you know, and it was good, so there you go. So I understand that, that's a good point, actually. I don't know if that reflects 
um, how I actually think, like my actual attitude. But um, it's a good point to, for me to ponder on at least. So yeah, I, I, I did ponder over that. Um, so let's see, what did I write about this? Um, I think, how did I get an idea of what to expect? I think I just observed people. Um, you know, quite a few of my friends, or like pretty much all my friends got married before me. So I was like one of the last ones. And so I got to see them in the process of getting married and then getting married and then having kids all before me, you know. So it's good to have friends who are older than you. Not all of your friends have to be older than you, but it's good to have some friends that are older than you because they got more experience and they can, uh, you know, they can teach you things. They could let you know some of the intimate details that maybe your parents or, you know, uncles or whatever wouldn't share or can't share or whatever. So that's always a good idea. And I just think I observe them. I ask them questions. Uh, can't deny, you know, the idea of like reading and listening to smart people in general. It always helps, you know, with uh, finding out what is the trend, like what is to be expected when one gets married. Um, so that that's useful, perhaps. Then I think also I observed and I spoke to people who are similar to me who got married and had children in a way that I might do. And so that's more custom to me. So, so it tells me more like what I was expecting. So for example, like I have friends who are maybe equally um, traditional uh, as me, who married people who are from families who are as traditional as uh, my wife's families. Yeah. So these things help me to get a good idea of what to be expected. If what, but on the flip side, what if uh, one of my friends he married someone from a more um, liberal family, you know, or less in, uh, Islamically inclined and stuff like that, and he told me his experience, then and I set my expectations based on that, then maybe I, I would have not got what I expected. You get what I'm saying? So um, I think it's because uh, the people that I observed and the people I asked questions to, um, they were people who kind of followed a similar trajectory to me, perhaps. You know, they were more traditional. They married people who were more traditional. And because I did the same thing, I kind of got similar to what they got, you know. So I, I had an idea of what to expect. I think another element is, this is where it's good, you know, in the UK they would say uh, it's good to be cultural, even though it's a pretty ridiculous term. Like, what does it mean to be cultural? But anyway, <laughs> on the, so I think it's a benefit of... of being uh, traditional or following a certain uh, traditions because you know what you're getting you know what you're signing up for like when I married my wife I could see that her family is very clearly um, in a certain culture like they follow certain traditions so I know what I was signing up for I could see that she also was in that you know in that culture and those traditions so I know what I'm signing up for likewise myself I gr was raised and I'm aware of um, certain culture you know like Algerian culture uh, a lot of my model of how marriage should be maybe was based on that so marrying an Algerian for example or yeah an Algerian let's say I know what to expect because I know Algerian culture yeah so I think that's a, another thing that helps you know what to expect whereas if you marry someone in the UK and who's like born and raised in the UK and um you know, maybe they're not very in touch with their parents or grandparents country where they came from. You kind of don't know what to expect as much. You know, you're marrying a, a, a girl. Uh, is she going to be? I don't know. Like she could be, people's you know personalities differ widely and what they expect and their culture varies widely because wildly because um in the UK, you know, it's like you're marrying someone. Okay, she is Muslim. Okay, and maybe she's uh, originally from Pakistan, but it still doesn't tell you too much of like what to expect from her because in the UK, everyone's kind of freestyling their own traditions and their own culture in a way. So you d you know less like what to expect, you know. So I think that allowed me to know what to expect. And what, what when I say I know what I expect, uh, I got what I expected, or it was as expected. What I mean is. Oh, marriage is not a fairy tale. Okay, that's expected and that was true. Marriage requires good communication. Okay, that's what I learned before and yes, that turned out to be very true. Um, 
marriage is not about the honeymoon phase it's about like the day day in day out having a good relationship and time together okay as expected yes that's true um marriage is not about having hobbies it's about like the same hobbies as your spouse it's about uh you know generally i don't know just getting on and um having the same values you know okay that's what i thought before and yes that became true as expected so that's what i mean by it's as expected i'm not talking about i understand kind of what you meant when you said it sounds ungrateful um but i i guess i didn't mean it that like that i didn't mean like marriage is good and I expected it to be good and i'm not grateful I, it's of course it's going to be good no i didn't mean that i just meant like communication i you know i expected that to be very important and yes it was very important you know uh same with uh, having a baby like okay i expected that you're going to lose sleep and then yes i did lose sleep i expected that you would be kind of uh you know you jump in the deep end in terms of knowing what's safe what's unsafe what do you do what you don't do and then it was like that so that's what i mean by it was as expected um yeah that's what i meant yeah so yeah and then how uh the questioner asked um what's the magic formula of expecting and then getting a result like i don't know if, if that's possible it's not something i don't think it's something i actively try to you know deal with like okay i'm gonna do this new thing how do i find out what to expect I guess I do to an extent well just like everyone does I don't think there's a formula or I'm not aware of it anyway it's just I guess educate yourself you know like you're going to get a job for the first time you're fresh out of uni then go speak to people who have 9 to 5s you know people who have been working in a similar field for a few years just ask them what it's like or ask someone who's had kids you know what's it like etc you know um something I remember interesting my friend told me because he had child like i don't know like seven years before me or something and he said that having children is amazing because you find more baraka in your time and i thought wow that's interesting that's the opposite of what i hear like i always hear oh i had kids i don't have any time to do xyz anymore life is hectic this and that but he came from a much more positive angle and he's like yeah it just means you have to you're forced to compress your stuff into a shorter amount of time it it forces you basically to be more efficient with your time um and i thought yeah that's a good way to think about it that's positive um you know whether it's uh, your hev or your side business or your um writing a book or you're making a podcast you have to squeeze it into a small amount of time uh when you have kids and that's good and yeah, it forces you to be more efficient and stuff so these are kind of expectations that i heard and they 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 ended up being true you know uh let me just see what else did i write here just as a point yeah like basically most things are not what you expect like just because i'm getting married and having kids ha- ha- was you know quite um what i expected it doesn't mean that there weren't other things that in my happen in my life that didn't happen as expected you know more obviously i think more than half of things that i thought that i expected didn't happen as expected i think that's the same with everyone and you know how do i think about that well i just believe that whatever happens in my life that allah will help me and allah will allow me to adapt and i have full confidence in allah not so much in myself but in allah that i will adapt I will keep a good mindset. I will be positive. I will be optimistic. I will return to Allah when I need his help. I just uh, have husn al-dhan billah that that will happen, right? So when things don't go to plan, when things happen that you didn't expect, then it's just like Allah's in control of everything. Allah will hook you up. You just have to trust in him and stuff. So yeah Allah will will help us regardless as long as we we believe in him we trust him and you know start the way you start with that is is with husn al-dhan having a good assumption of Allah assuming that Allah will help you when things don't go to plan um and you know as we know from the hadith qudsi um uh Allah is as his slave ex- expects him to be so if his slave expects allah to be merciful with him and help him out then allah will help him out 
And if Allah, uh, if the slave has a bad opinion of Allah that oh, Allah's trying to punish me, Allah doesn't want me to go to Jannah and these kind of things, then that will become true as well. That is how Allah will treat you. So uh, that's very powerful uh, hadith. I think maybe one of the most life, definitely one of the most life changing hadith I've ever kind of learnt and thought about, and contemplated on is the hadith of Husn al uh, And it's a hadith that comes straight from Allah. It's not something that you know, the Prophet said is, uh, is it came on the tongue of the Prophet ﷺ, but it was from Allah directly. That's what hadith Qudsi is. So, um, so yeah, that's the, the topic of expectations. Um, yeah. Uh, I think and it's easy to find out what to expect with marriage and children because it's something that most people go through. And when most people go through it, you have more, you know, data, if you like, on it. And so you hear more and more stories about it because it's very common. You hear lots of stories, lots of observations. And so you kind of get an idea of what to um, expect. The, the thing is, it could go the other way, the negative way, which is you hear a lot of negative stories. And I think that's maybe the more common uh, the more common situation is that you're not married and all your friends are married and all your friends are complaining about marriage, about their husband, about their wife, about their children. Um, and that's something I think everybody needs to refrain from. I mean, obviously, complaining in general uh, is a bad thing. And you should only complain to Allah in, in the ideal situation. Um, and complaining, you know, is something it, it has no benefit. It's just venting. That's the negative thing. If you're saying negative things in in order to try and get help or advice from someone, that's different. But the culture of complaining about your spouse, especially, is really terrible. And you're putting people off getting married by doing that. And you're also kind of setting themselves, setting them up perhaps for failure in their marriage because they're getting married because they kind of have to one way or another. But yet they're going into the marriage maybe with a negative mindset. Maybe they're they're going to marriage instead of having high standards and thinking how can I have the most amazing marriage they might go into marriage thinking you know marriage sucks but we just have to get married because that's just what we do and I think those two different attitudes will have a big impact on your marriage you know um, so you got to be very careful with this complaining thing I mean I get the impression it's very common for people to complain about their spouses it's very very bad um, or even to some extent saying good things about your spouse is also bad because people compare, you know. So you kind of just, I mean, I don't know about for women how to deal with that, but at least amongst me and my friends, uh, us men, we don't really talk about our wives. So that's good. That keeps us clear of that issue. Although apparently in some countries, in some cultures, maybe in the UK, it's a bit more normal to talk about your wife and stuff. Um but yeah, I think there's a lot of benefits just keeping those kind of things private unless there's some specific benefit to mentioning them. Um, so yeah, that's how you, that's where the expectations come from is maybe going to smart people, going to pious people and just asking them what their experience was. And that maybe gives you um, a good idea, you know, and then you got to prepare for it, of course. So yeah, that's my answer to that question. I hope I dealt with that well. I hope this was a good episode. I mean, just me by myself. I tried to make it better than previous uh, solo episodes by preparing a little bit the answers. Of course, I only dealt with two questions, but I'm actually happy about that because I went into so much detail. Hopefully you, you enjoyed, the, especially the AI part, because I think as an area, maybe I could give some, shed some light on. And maybe it's not the average thing you would learn about or hear about. So, yeah, thanks for sticking with me if you can hear this. If you have any questions um, for us, uh, you'll get them answered, inshallah, on the show, just like these questions were answered today, uh, by going to mindheistpodcast.com. And then you can either email us, and then, of course, we might know your name from that, but uh, not a big problem. You won't share the full name or anything. Or if you want to stay anonymous, then you can go to our curious cat and ask anonymously which uh, the link for is in is on that on that link mindheistpodcast.com uh thanks always for listening for giving us your attention uh, it's always appreciated uh equally uh, what's appreciated is you know kind of giving us any uh suggestions to improve uh because we're not we're not very good i mean i don't know if we're good or not at this really um it's part of nasiha you know the prophet said 
the deen itself is nasiha. It is pushing people to the good and pushing people away from the bad. So it's your duty to help us improve in that sense. So please do that uh, by email or anonymously. And of course, you know, just thinking about this, we will take this, the advice more seriously if you email rather than anonymously for obvious reasons. Having said that, thanks everyone for listening. As always, uh, we'll be back inshallah next uh, week with episode uh, 63 inshallah from myself and uh, you know I'm sure Muhammad if he was here he would also be saying assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh subhanakallahumma wa bihamdika ashhadu an la ilaha illa anta astaghfiruka wa atubu ilayk